we should not write off the smallest states in the country and just assume that those are Republican forever. There's just no reason to accept that uh, as a permanent state. John Favreau is still vacationing down at Mar-a-Lago, spending some much-deserved time with Twitter. So Love and I are holding down the fort today for an extra fun July 4th themed show. Love it. Do you have any fireworks ready for us today? No, the LAPD took all they took all my fireworks. The LAPD took all my fireworks and they were like, it's fine. We know what to do. Anyway, it was a mess. <laughs> uh, well, listen, this show hopefully won't be a mess. For, those, gonna... for those who don't have local L.A. news, LAPD blew up a truck in, in its part of town. They, I, but anyway, I didn't even sorry. know that. Wow, that's exciting. We are going to talk about narratives in politics and beyond. And you might be asking why narratives, because narratives, that's what July 4th is all about, right? We are told a story about America stretches from 1776 to today, and there's an important discussion to be had about what's real, what's not, what's good. What could be a blind spot for us as Americans? And we're also going to pick apart some other common media narratives in politics in our culture that sometimes are good, sometimes drive us crazy. We're going to have a little fun with it. Love it. Uh, let's start with this narrative that defines July 4th and defines this episode, which is American exceptionalism. What's your take? Good? Bad? It's complicated? So here's what I want to say about American exceptionalism, and it is this. Anyone who believes that America is the best country in the world cannot also believe in American exceptionalism. American mm. exceptionalism is a pejorative to describe people who believe that America is the best country in the world despite evidence. And so when someone says, oh, they don't even believe in American exceptionalism, it's really fucking confusing to me because presumably someone who says, I think America is the fucking best, one of which is me, I'm one of those people. And uh, <laughs> I, it's not because I believe or you believe. If the person who says that doesn't believe in American exceptionalism, they believe America is the best based on the facts, right? Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. say you believe in American exceptionalism is like a paradox. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how it doesn't really make sense? I hear what you're saying. I mean, I think, well, look, just so listeners know, Love is constantly just popping into the office and being like, America, <laughs> fucking best. <laughs> Going to the bathroom. <laughs> we rule. Sure. I mean, like, I think some of this is kind of like definitional, right? Like, there are things about America that are exceptional. Until recently, I would have included our history of uh, peaceful transfers of power. That got a little sure. complicated on January 6th, right? Our constitution, our system of government is unique in that we have this capacity to amend it and fix it over time. I think the term American exceptionalism, it was first def coined by Alexis de Tocqueville, right? But it's changed a ton over time. And I think we get into trouble when we get too high on our own supply. And we decide that it means like America is more just and more pure than anyone else. And like our way of life is just inherently better than everyone else's. And we're going to force it on you. Like that to me is the real risk. Well, it's that, you know, Obama got dinged for saying Americans believe in American exceptionalism in the same way Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. And it was like he it was like a two weeks of fucking stories about <laughs> him not believing America is the best. But actually, he was saying something different. American exceptionalism isn't something you can believe in the inside. It's what people on the outside say about us and our myopic view about America being the center of every story. That said, mm. I believe America is the center of every story. That's my position, which is why I reject American exceptionalism, because America is the best. You see the problem? I think I do. You do you see the issue? I like it. I like it. I also think, like, what I kind of, like, you know, cringe at a little bit is the constant, like, reflexive, this isn't who we are rhetoric whenever something terrible happens in the United States, which ignores the reality that a lot of the things we're talking about that are terrible in that moment have happened a lot, right? Slavery, Jim Crow, th these are some of the recent conversations we had. And then there was this just ridiculous, idiotic uh, 1776 commission report that the Trump folks leaked, or released, sorry, right at the end of the administration that was literally just whitewashed, literally, US history in an effort to push back on the 1619 project. American exceptionalism to me is good when it's aspirational. And it's a story about America constantly trying to live up to an ideal. It's really bad when it's a cudgel that just silences criticism. And I think that's what like, kind of the, the right wing version has become. There's like another level to the racism that goes along with the fighting against teaching of our history in full. Like, you know, oh, and, and, you know, you see this with people like Josh Hawley saying, like, I don't want to mm -hmm. teach my I don't want our kids to learn that America is racist. I want American people to have hope in America. And implicit in that 
you know, Sam Sanders and we, we talked about with Sam is that, mm -hmm. you know, who is who is teaching for is teaching for for white kids. But it's also who is who does America belong to and to not ref, to not include the full scope of our history in our patriotism is to deny the Americanness of the people denied America's promise for hundreds mm -hmm. of years. And like it's their it's this was their country, too. And their yes. th this was their story, too, in full. And so like anyway, end of thought. I, I agree with that, and that's why I do think it's more than symbolic that we are now celebrating and recognizing Juneteenth, and that we've made a lot of progress in this set of conversations. Um, I have another narrative for you that drives okay. me a little bit crazy, which is that Washington used to be a bastion of civility, if we could only get back to that. And mm -hmm. I and I'd say, like, you know, look, you could start this narrative in a lot of places. Like, if you go way back to the 1800s, right, a, a representative beat Charles Sumner with a metal tipped cane on the Senate floor. I don't know that that's the civility we're looking for. The more modern iteration is Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Neill, they would have a scotch, talk like men, cut deals on social security reform. Why can't we get back to that? Woe is Washington, right? Like we miss those days. And the problem here is this is such rose colored revisionist history. Like, yes, these guys cut a deal, but it wasn't because of friendship or civility. Love it. How civil is this quote to you? Quote, the evil is in the White House at the present time, and that evil is a man who has no care and no concern for the working class of America and the future generations of America and who likes to ride a horse. He's cold. He's mean. He's got <laughs> ice water for blood. That's Tip O'Neill talking about Ronald Reagan. I like I like that. I like that uh, side of Tip O'Neill. You don't hear enough about it. Yeah, it's also like, you know, um, one of the one of the great political deals ever made in Washington was between northern Democrats and southern Democrats to uh, allow the South to be an authoritarian region so yeah. that uh, FDR could become president, you know? Yeah, not and good. The Democrats could win elections, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I mean, deals, the, some deals are really bad, I think. My view is that deals inherently aren't good or bad. It's a, it depends I, on the deal, I think. That's my view I, on deals. Honestly, this narrative, I, I really wrote this down. This, is, this narrative is the cousin of the sort of bipartisan policies are inherently better than partisan policies narrative which is just absurd when you think about like the iraq mm -hmm. war versus the affordable care act but yeah i mean the, the civility case like I, it just ignores so many things it ignores the way the parties have changed over time it ignores the way gerrymandering has radicalized the house of representatives and changed political incentives and it also just ignores the reality that yeah okay sure like members of congress used to be better friends they were also more homogenous at that time it was more white it was more male it was more christian it was a bunch of people from the same social class so like I, I think we just need to be very careful for the sort of olden days that we're pining for because if you look under the hood i'm not sure that they, they were quite that great i agree i don't really do very much pining as a rule <laughs> not a piner my next my narrative is uh, moderate democrats in swing districts taking more moderate stances are hurt by left-wing members in left-wing districts taking more left-wing stances. Mm. Um, this came up uh, uh, soon after the election when there was some uh, uh, hand-wringing about the fact that, yes, Joe Biden won, but the House majority shrunk, that Democrats uh, weren't able to win a resounding victory in the Senate that we were ultimately later able to win the Georgia races, obviously. Um, and this began with a fight between Connor Lamb and AOC that I don't think paid out, played out particularly helpfully, but, but I I'm glad sort of has died down. And basically, you know, the crux of the issue is that it is it seems very true that moderate Democrats or Democrats in swing districts are getting tagged by monikers like socialism or uh, uh, to fund the police or Medicare for all or a host of other policies that are not helpful to them amongst the the kind of suburban moderates that these that these more moderate members are trying to win. And so where mm -hmm. do they point? They point to the uh, the people on the left of the party, both in Congress and outside of Congress, the activists who have made defund the police or abolish ICE or Medicare for all or a host of other left wing priorities. Sort of they have kind of found very ingenious ways to frame these debates, simple, elegant, powerful messages that break through and have helped shift our debate, but then uh, through Fox News and propaganda organs get tagged to all Democrats. And my issue here is, I think, so, you know, you know, John, Tommy and I, we talk about this all the time that like, I think one thing that you see on Twitter, but I think you see in a larger way is um, it's more fun to yell at people who respond to you. Totally. Uh, it's more fun to engage with people who see you, acknowledge you, care what you have to say, or perhaps right. in some way affected by your arguments. 
it's a similar phenomenon of, of looking for your keys uh, where the light is shining. But the reality is whether the left of the party takes a strong stance or not, Fox News, Tucker Carlson, uh, right wing radio, the, the, the Facebook right wing organiza- organizations, they don't need um, a lot of help to find the activist, the random person the, the, to saying something to the left that they're going to tag you with. And so don't hate the player, hate the game. The, re- the issue is that we have a massive right wing operation that's taking every extreme or every left idea and trying to paint everybody with it. And we have to fight that not each other, because there's always going to be a left of the party, and they're always going to be trying to pull us to the left. That's a good thing. And so we got to find a way to fight the actual cause. The cause of the problem is not the left person saying something. It's the system that takes that left person's words and applies it to everybody, even if it's not helpful in certain places. And we, I think we lose sight of that because it's easier to argue with people who argue back. That's a good one. That's a good one that I believe deeply. Uh, here's one that's a, little, that's a little tough to swallow for uh, former... White House communications aides, which is the bully pulpit. That there, there is this belief, a narrative, that the White House comes with a bully pulpit that is this huge rhetorical weapon that presidents could pull out at any time, and you can just use it as you will, as you want, to move political opinion. Now, what folks need to know is there is no evidence that this is true. A bunch of political scientists have dug into the data. So Ronald Reagan was known as the great communicator. He saw support for programs he opposed, like regulations, healthcare spending, welfare, education, environmental protection. Those support for those things went up during his presidency, and support for defense spending went down when he was championing it. Uh, other researchers looked at FDR's fireside chats. They only increased his approval by less than 1%. His big speeches on issues like entering the world, uh, Second World War, they didn't move the electorate either. Bill Clinton visited 200 cities and towns before the 1994 midterms. God bless his staff. Uh, his numbers dropped. His health care bill failed. Republicans retook the House. Bush tried to sell Social Security privatization, failed. Gallup looked at the impact of State of the Union addresses going back to 1978, and they found that they rarely affect uh, the president's public standing in any meaningful way. So my like take home here is that sometimes talking about stuff could just backfire. Like when a president talks about an issue, things that are nonpartisan can become partisan the minute you champion it. So I think White Houses and activists need to think just as much about, do we want the president to not focus on this, to not talk about it and just work it behind the scenes and see if that's a more effective path to getting something done than to like make it the headline of the State of the Union? Yeah, I think there's two things. I think that's one, I think sometimes it's like, um, uh, I think politics, really messaging generally, I think it's true for you know, corporations trying to sell something. Um, it's like being on a swing. You got to pump your legs at the right time. Mm-hmm. You got to be resonant with the wave. You know, it doesn't help to, 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 to pump your legs halfway down. You got to be right at the top or right at the back. And so I think sometimes it's about knowing the moment where you can kind of use the momentum of a conversation and, and move it a little bit further than it otherwise would have gone. Easier to make a fire worse than it is to start a fire. Um, mm-hmm. And then the deeper part of this, too, is Political news is about people, it's about individuals, it's about personalities. Much harder to make systems, trends, um, institutions the protagonist uh, in the news. It just doesn't work. Uh, and so we end up talking about individuals and personalities when we need to be talking about like systems and structures. I think that's right. Yep. Oh, here's one. Um, this, is, this is a stretch, but I think implicit in a lot of our politics right now including my own, so I'll own this and take, I, I, it doesn't change my, um, why don't I just say it? The nature of polarization, that the nature of polarization as it is right now is like a semi-permanent fixture. And so the only way we can combat things like the anti-majoritarian nature of the Senate is to add states, or the only way uh, we can, uh, um, you know, stop uh, Republicans from having an inherent advantage in gerrymandering is to stop gerrymandering. I want to stop those things. And I want D.C. to become a state. I want Puerto Rico to have the chance to choose if they want to become a state. I want to add seats to the Supreme Court. I'm for all of it. Let's go. Uh, but I think sometimes there's a, like a learned helplessness around why Democrats fail to win in some of the reddest places in the country when Democratic politics like expanding Medicaid, raising the minimum wage, union politics sometimes do much better than Democrats. And so I think we should sometimes 
put a little more thought <laughs> into why there's this massive delta between democratic policies and democratic politicians and when we are also focused on fighting some of these counter majoritarian institutions because like you know we weren't talking as much about how anti-democratic the senate was when we had 60 seats really didn't come up in the conversation as much so like we should not write off the smallest states in the country and just assume that those are republican forever there's just no reason to accept that uh as a permanent state that's good that's good uh here's one for you this is how we got trump people love to state their pet issue and say this is how we got trump my hot take is you're always wrong 100 percent of the time you're wrong when you make this claim because it wasn't one thing that's that's more of a, a statement than a debate. Here's one for here's one to debate with you, Levitt. Okay. Public apologies work, and they're the right thing to do. I used to be a firm oh. believer that like if you screw up in the public eye, you own it, you apologize, you bust out that notes app, you take your lumps, right? I feel 100% confident now that that is the wrong advice, and that our culture punishes people who apologize, who you know it, it just gets covered more. There's voices who say your apology sucked, it wasn't good enough. Those drown out all the others, and it's just it's a broken process. I don't think that there's a clear rule. Um, I think it depends. I think one <laughs> one more one clear version of this to me is uh, not for, not for moral reasons, but for pure mercenary political calculus. Yes, never resign. Never, ever yes. resign. Like, resigning is always a mistake. <laughs> uh, Andrew Cuomo, still governor. Elliot Spitzer, I think he's in space, maybe, or with John Edwards <laughs> building houses. I don't know where they are. Never, ever Mark resign. Sanford, like, yeah. like, maybe it's Mark Sanford, you know. Well, Mark Sanford, he resigned, he and he thing. ran again, that he won, yeah. and then he lost. But he's a weirdo, and he's an exception. And, you know, edge Likes cases make bad laws, you know. Um, but... Um, <laughs> If someone close to me was and that and was in a was in a terrible political scandal and asked me what to do and I was focused only on what was best for them, not for the state, not for the government, mm-hmm. not for anybody mm-hmm. but them as individuals, I would say you hang on for dear fucking life. You Cling. hide, you do whatever. Maybe apologize though. See, this is why I think it's sometimes oh. you can uh, you can get in an apology. Although Liz Brunig, who is a great writer, uh, and often heterodox in a way that makes Twitter very angry, but who I respect a lot, talks about how we have created a kind of system um, where there is uh, lots of repentance but no acceptance. Yes. <laughs> and so, like, that's not ideal. That's no. not ideal. Uh, but um, end of uh, incoherent thought. <laughs> no, so, I agree with all of that. Do you have, uh, do you have any more narratives? I have some oh, I have ones. one more. I have Please. one more. The value of authenticity. Uh, there's this idea that what we're looking for is authentic politicians. And I think Trump ought to be the thing that kills that dead because he is on stage <laughs> an incredibly authentic liar, a yeah. fully present performer living in the moment, saying what is in his heart and obviously completely full of shit. Because when you're saying you're looking – so. I think it's because authenticity is a lot of good traits stripped of their meaning, stripped of their morality. Like authenticity is an impression of honesty, integrity, trustworthiness, right? But Mm -hmm. when you signal to the world that we are looking for politicians that seem authentic, you announce it to ambitious people of all levels of virtue that like what you need to do is put on a performance of authenticity. And yep. you know what? They'll do it. They'll yep. do it. So we don't want authenticity. We want integrity. And by the way, I think sometimes this on th- the authenticity trap is that authenticity is, I think, for, uh, for, for many reasons, easier to be performed by old white guys mm-hmm. and often harder to be grasped in the media by, by women, by people of color, by gay people. So... Uh, no authentic integrity, not authenticity. That's my. I like that. That's my position. I, I like that. Um, okay, this is a random one. I don't know if this is a narrative as much as just like a thing that annoys me. <laughs> Why do people gender inanimate objects? You hear this mostly from men, a lot of times around like food, like steaks and beer, masculine, salads mm-hmm. and wine, feminine. No, it's fucking food. You're eating sure. food, sustenance to keep you alive. But I actually think it's kind of a dumb damaging thing if you think about the idea of telling a bunch of young kids especially young boys that like eating healthy is not what they should be doing for like made up gender reasons it's a thing that's really bothered me for a long time it's playing out right now around um uh like um 
non I don't I'm trying to even say it without the pejor- lab grown meat like mm-hmm. meat that is not made of cows but made in yep. it, out of other materials and you know there's this like culture war going on now in Texas where they're like you can't call right. it meat and you know right. and, and and I saw there was a great ad by one of the companies impossible beyond one of the fake meat companies fake meat's not the right term we need a better term you haven't cracked it yet I told you this you haven't listened <laughs> uh, their campaign is are you afraid you'll like it which I think is really good it's really good. good kind of pushing back on that. But yeah, it's like <laughs> there's always this thing. It was like when Ted Cruz put bacon around the end of like some kind of a gun to cook yeah, the bacon with the gun. The bacon. It's and it's absurd. Yeah, masculine food is pretty uh, incoherent. Um, but, you know. Decades of bad advertising basically just rotting our brains. It's interesting. It's like even flowers, right? Like flowers You're are right. feminine. What? 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 what it, it's very – it's – uh. It's hard, right? Because so much of language is analogy, and like we we speak in analogies all the time, but they really do get into our brains. Um, gender, <laughs> it's a real pickle. It's a real pickle. Uh, last <laughs> one I prepped for you. Stalin was a good listener. Now, okay, lo- love it. Yeah. <laughs> this, this take was hot on the Twitter streets a couple of days ago. A professor at Riverside City College in California tweeted, people say I idolize, in quotes, Stalin. Not true. I hold a fair and balanced view. The man was neither savior nor saint, but he was at once a very successful revolutionary, a great contributor to Marxist theory, and said to be a great listener and collaborator during discussions, end quote. So you might look at Stalin and see a paranoid totalitarian leader who threw millions of his own people into the gulags, I see a shoulder to cry on. There is no view too stupid <laughs> to find quarter on the internet. None. Not a one. Not a one. And when I see Elon Musk tweets, I think maybe rocket science is easy. When <laughs> I see Ben Carson's public Life. utterances, I think maybe brain surgery is easier than uh-huh. it looks. Uh, when I see this person... Uh, tweet what he's been tweeting about fucking Stalin, one of the <laughs> worst mass murderers in human history. I think maybe getting uh, a, a, a job as a professor is easier than it looks. Uh, yeah. And um, here's the other thing I would say: you can say nothing if you want. Say nothing. All of us. We can just you All can just us. let let it go by. You can just let it go by. Yeah, I thought Bo Burnham put it very well in his special. Yeah, just. Shut Just the shut up. the fuck up. For one uh, hour. In Dark Knight, there's this moment where this cop wants to interrogate the Joker, and the cop says, I've seen, you know, I've seen a lot of punks, and I know the difference between the ones you can hit and the ones who will like it. Well, I'm going to hit you, and I'll just have to try to like it more. That is what engaging with trolls is. You are engaging with the Joker who likes the pain and whom you cannot beat. So, so you know what? Don't do it. The lesson of Dark Knight uh, don't feed the trolls. <laughs> don't feed the trolls. I totally, I see it. I like it a lot. 